<laughs> Welcome back to the breakdown. No, you're not seeing double. I am back and it is great to be here. I tell you what, I have had FOMO, fear of missing out. I've missed the game and I've missed you all as well. It's been a great couple of weeks, but how much happens in a few weeks in rugby in New Zealand and Australia? The Black Ferns have a brand new coach, the Crusaders. They've lost twice, once to an Australian side. And who would have thought, JK, maybe you, Blues, they are top of the table right now. But one thing that never changes is our very own three wise men. I can call you all the three wise men, can't I? And I can't wait to hear what they have to say. Let's get stuck in. Breakdown is brought to you by Neurofen Zavance. Available every day at Chemist Warehouse. Koto Katoa, great to have you joining us on The Breakdown and it's great to be back as well. My biggest challenge tonight is going to be staying awake, but I know with you three on board I'll have no problems at all. Jeff Wilson, Mills Malayana, Sir John Kerwin. How much has happened? Blues are You're back. Table. You're back, Kirsty, which is fantastic. It's Highlanders are Australian winning. Teams. The Australian are back. The Australians are back, 100%. That result has just finished with the Hurricanes getting a telling up from the Brumbies. Mm. The Brumbies two weeks in a row. I don't know when the last time that happened. I mean, is that the century? I'm not 100% sure. But what I do know, Kirsty, is you are 100% the best at social network that, that we are. The social world. And so we want you to run through some of your pictures. Oh, no. Some of your photos <laughs> on tour. To me. Run me through who this is. What's this? Where are you? Well, this is at an art gallery in New York. Jean-Michel uh, Basquiat, who's an incredible artist uh, from the 60s. Oh, we've, we've, we've gone galleries. through, we've run everything through. Oh, how oh. good was this? You oh. went to the Nets. Yeah, the, the, the NBA playoffs, that was oh, an absolute highlight. How that. they do sport over there in America is something... We need to take notes, don't we? Absolutely. It, it, it was never-ending, though. We're sitting there and they just kept coming and coming. You're saying you've missed a lot. Bottom line, there's just so much more, so much you got oh, up to. Oh, well, we've got so much to talk about. We don't need to do this, do what we? What's this? What's this? Yeah, that was Coachella. That oh, was a fantastic music festival. Are you, are you starting to feel uncomfortable? <laughs> Is that what's happening? Now I'm starting to regret sharing all of this on social media. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. And finish off with oh. this, because you talked about the fact the food was amazing. I told JK, I feel about 10 kilos heavier because I feel like I've eaten a year's worth of food in the space That's of what you're days. supposed to do, Kirst. Do not worry about it. I didn't it's stop like eating. like ordering a salad when you go out for dinner. Eat a salad at home. <laughs> like, when you're on holiday, <laughs> when you're on holiday, <laughs> eat. Well, I definitely didn't have a salad, uh, but it was fantastic. But you know what? We've got rugby to talk about, don't we? Let's get straight into Super Rugby, shall we? Because we have plenty to talk about. Super Rugby with Nurofen available at Chemist Warehouse. We're going to start off at Lightheart Oval because something special happened. The Waratahs couldn't win a game last season and they go over and they beat the Crusaders. JK, no one picked this. What happened? No, no one picked. Uh, the, the Crusaders are starting slow. They're traditionally a really good starters. They put pressure on the start of the game. They've been starting slow all year. But I also think the Waratahs have been building. You know, when you listen to them after the game, um, when you listen to them talk, they're saying, we're building a family. You know, you can see the culture starting to turn around. And I think they played out of themselves, really, Mills. Oh, they had the perfect start, didn't they? I mean, 17 old points up. I mean, they've got some good young talent too, some real superstars that sort of can make breaks from anywhere. And then it was really that factor, you know, that what they're building, um, you know, the fact they're building that culture uh, to, to absolutely bring it home. I, I'm, I'm with you, JK. It's, the Crusaders are starting slow, but I think all of the New Zealand teams just look like they're, they're just a little bit sort of you know, flat-footed. Flat they're not, not as excited as what we sort of have seen in, in the past, and it's almost as if uh, the, the Australian teams have come out and really motivated. They're refreshed, and they can't wait to get into us. So there was a team last year in New Zealand, the Chiefs, had a really difficult start to their season. They went 0-8, and, and, and it was well documented. This team was struggling last year. They were young, inexperienced. They've got some players into their environment, major shoes different. Michael Hooper in that environment has led them from the front. He is a world-class leader and player. But two words, Richie Monga mm. was not playing in this game for the Crusaders. Look, he is their talisman. He is their best player. He has been multiple times Super Rugby Player of the Year. So when you take a key player, a key piece of your puzzle out of it, your first five, you don't win this competition without a world-class first five. It has proven over time in history. So I don't read anything into this result other than the fact they've now lost control of their destiny, particularly about controlling playing at home in the playoffs. So for me, Scott Robinson's got some things that he'll want to deal with, but in the end, 
his best player, his most influential player, was not playing because he was on rest duties. It was time to him have a week off. Well, let's not go into that. It's a whole nother show. But bottom line... <laughs> he wants uh, to. Uh, yeah, uh, what's that? Do you want to go into it? Oh, what, well, you, bottom you line, I'll tell you what, Adi Savia is due for a rest. He's plays every, every game. Are you saying to me, though... Are you saying to me that they looked like a championship side, a champion winning side, like years have passed, mm. and they're just wishing, missing Moana? I don't agree. Oh, they've been dominant up until, I think, this year. Last year they showed signs. Uh, they're still very, very good through Super Rugby Aotearoa. But bottom line, I think the gap is closed across the board. The Australian teams have come back. And I think, Mills, I look at the influence now that Dave Rennie has had. In the 18 months that he's had the job, and I see it start to filter through, they are looking more and more like a team that's got, a, got someone over the top of them giving them all the information they need to know. When he left New Zealand, he's given Australia an opportunity to close the gap, and now everybody, their coaches included over there, have a better understanding how to, be, how to play against New Zealand teams. I 100% agree with that. They, they looked a totally different sort of um, sides. I mean, uh, I still agree with the fact that they possibly need to lose a side to bring the majority of that sort of talent in. But I, I think the way they're playing, they're, they're playing similar to what we have. They've almost evolved in those couple of years that, that Renz has been over there, whereas what worries me a bit, a bit now is sort of where have, where have we gone? We haven't yeah. changed you know, too much. The, the gap closing, we look really we look really flat and if I can compare it to sort of our end of year tour, we almost look like you know, our teams look like that in some, in some way. Well Jeff, you asked the question, when was the last time an Australian team or two Australian teams beat two New Zealand teams on one weekend? Uh, our fantastic producer Jim, he's down into the archives, 2014 was the last time. Eight years ago. Eight years ago. Eight years ago. Oh, it's, I, it's a significant change and we've seen it and if you think about comparing last year's Trans-Tasman competition to this year's competition of Super Rugby Pacific, this is what it looks like, OK? We went to Australia last year. On average, we scored 39 points a game. They scored 20 points a game. This year, in 2022, the significant difference. We are scoring nine and a half points less, and they are scoring a couple of points. So all of a sudden, the margin is just over seven, which is a converted try, which means the game is on the line when you're going to the death. So you move that on. How does that mean in terms of our attack? Where have we got to? We're not making the same line, break, line breaks. We made 9.4 last year, just six on average a game. Those are try scoring opportunities that aren't there. They have improved their attack all of a sudden. 1.2 over another um, line break per game this season. So all of a sudden, that's why the gap is closing. They've got some uh, development they've made in their game in terms of the defence and attack, and then average tackles missed per game. 26 they were missing last year. It's under 20. We're also now missing less tackles this season. Different nature of the competition because we chased bonus points last year, trying to make it into a final one round. But I think that's where I see the difference. We talked about it last week, guys, didn't we? The fact that Bottom line, JK, defence is winning the day, the gap is closed, that's why these teams are getting nearer and nearer to winning, on a, I think, on a more consistent basis. Hence, we've got a great competition in front of us over the next few weeks. Yeah, I think it's fantastic for the competition. The renewed competition from the Australian side, I think, makes it way more exciting. Uh, I still think there's the yellow and red card issue that unless the players start sorting that out, I mean, there's another silly one in the in the Hurricanes game today. That could be really costly as you head towards the final. So, I think the competition's good. Mills, it's got a. I mean, I hope we all win New Zealand sides, but we want the winning and losing during the competition makes a better spectacle. Yeah, it certainly does. And, and the fact that I mean, um, you know, we've, we're probably a little bit more surprised at how fast the, the Australians have actually adapted and closed that gap uh, a lot earlier than what we had. But what does it make? It makes it fantastic competition going forward. What was I just? What was it like on the sideline? Because you know, when we go and look at games and watch games, and there, I mean, did you notice a difference in confidence around the whole arena um, the, from the players? What were you feeling? Oh, there was definitely a different vibe. It's almost kind of like the Australians have sort of sensed that there's, uh, you know, they've gotten better at, at sort of an aspect of the game, and now they're sort of growing. They've, they've got that that confidence, whereas. When, you, when, the, when our boys walked out, out there, it was kind of like it was almost like status quo. You know, it's, a, it's just another game. We'll get, we'll get through, and there'd be tough moments in some of those games too, where they've sort of um, they've got themselves into a really a patchy spot to get them back out, back out of there. That's when they've sort of really struggled. So the interesting thing for me was what, what, what's going to happen when the Aussie teams come over here. You know, how how are we going to sort of adapt to that? And you know, are we going to sort of push on? Because we've seen in the past, once we've played the, the Australians a couple of times and sort of seen the way they've sort of played, you know, we we, we tend to analyse them. You know, analyse the house down and then actually 
you know, come, they come here and we, when we beat, beat them convincingly. Well, even games we've won have been unconvincing. I mean, the Blues' performance against the Force. I mean, you can't be in complete control of a game at half-time and then, not for the first time this season, JK, they didn't finish the job. They weren't ruthless nervous. enough. Bottom line, they were lucky to get out of this. They've been lucky in a couple of games. They, look, they were dominant for the first 40 minutes. Then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, we'll just rely on our defence. You cannot rely on your defence for 40 minutes to get yourself into a position to win a game. They were very fortunate. The Chiefs were the same, just across the line the Reds. I think, and this is what I, you know, the second Blues I Cup test this year is at Eden Park. It could be for the trophy. It could be for it. And this team, the more, this, this country, and it's right I'm talking about, the more games they win in this competition, the bigger are, belief they're going to have. Are, they, are, are we, um, and this is something I care passionately about, are we too process driven? And instead of emotion, I mean, I forget the young man's name, and that's bad of mine, but he's crying after yeah. the Waratahs yeah. game and running to see his family and hugging his family and all this sort of stuff. I mean, when you talk about us running out and going through process, nothing wrong with it. I don't think it's a... It's not a criticism, it's just an observation. But do we need to bring a little bit more emotion, Mills? Yeah, emotion in the past has actually hurt us too because we've overdone it. You know, we've had overdone the emotion, we've sort of pushed the emotional buttons too much. But I think we, we're definitely lacking something. Maybe it's COVID, maybe there's a bit of fatigue there. But certainly at this stage, we just we just seem really flat. You know, is it a case where we've sort of beat each other up, you know, so, so many times and then gone over there and the Australians are now, now refreshed? I mean, I you think about the margins. It was 19 last year. 19.2 was the difference on average. It's 7.7 this year. So it just tells you, just by the raw numbers, the fact that they are closer and closer. I, I just look at the way that they're playing. They're playing yeah. with so much more purpose, yeah. so much more belief. This Brumbies performance today was against the Hurricanes team, which was strong. I come back to the fact, though, this Hurricanes team haven't managed to settle on their first five just yet. No Ruben Love around, which I don't think is helping them. But bottom line, the Brumbies were a better team. A much better team today, and I think it's great for the competition. Really, really is. A re remarkable, really. And, and it gives us something, a blueprint, for us to look forward to every week now. I can't wait to see the Australian teams come to New Zealand now and see whether or not they can replicate this form, because it's been impressive. You mentioned the Dave Rennie factor. I'm interested in how does one person change uh, six Super Rugby franchises across Australia, and will this translate to the international game in a year's time when you think about being in Paris? I think one of the positives of, of New Zealand rugby for the last probably 20 years has been actually the super rugby coaches getting together. I remember when I came back um, and coached here, you know, you'd get together and you'd have discussions about defence and individual skills, and I think that's been a real strength. I don't think it was in Australia, and I think Dave Renner has gone over there and coordinated everyone together and said, we need to play towards a style of game. You've got to be careful that does that doesn't homogenise you and take away a lot of creativity in the game. And I think you've got to find that balance. And I think um, Dave Renner will find that balance over there, Mills, because he's been in, in both camps, right? He's got a real balance in, in it as well. First, you've got to get buy-in from all the coaches, you know, the, the fact, you know, and when you look at across the, their teams, they're all sort of playing a similar sort of style. So, but you, you're right, you have to be careful when you go into an environment. That's what we've been really good at. I mean, you, you allow the, you, the coaches to bring something, um, you know, create this sort of, uh, like, a template, but allow the coaches in their own environments to create to, uh, you know, other aspects of it that sort of bring out the best of the guys. But certainly from a skill pr perspective, uh, the kicking game, the balance of what, what they're actually doing, a lot better than what we've ever seen. And that's where Renz is really big on. And he's a no-nonsense coach. And I get a sense that I think a lot of these players are playing tougher. They're more resilient. He pushes guys to the edge. He has left players out of his initial squad. Scott Seo, for example, one of those, and asked the question of him, I need you to go front up and perform. James Parsons, who we're talking to after the show about what's happening here in New Zealand, he said to me, all of a sudden, he's turned a corner. He's back to showing what he can do. I think that's what he's brought. Not necessarily some of that, that technical stuff just yet, but in terms of the toughness, the resiliency, and we're seeing it, and they're not taking a backward step, and they're lifting their performance. There's some new players stepping up with a year, a year, a year and a half under their belt in his environment, and you said it, he has connected the coaches. The coaches, I think, in Australia used to offer, uh, operate in their silos. Queensland, where obviously Brad Thorne's there now, you know, he's obviously made a big difference. The Brumbies team have always been their own little big bubble, where I think they've all come together now, they're understart, they're a big part of the big picture. Big picture's got to perform. 
Well, it's exciting, isn't it? Because you just don't know who's going to win when you're playing these trans-Tasman matches now. And when you're talking about excitement, you cannot go past the Fijian Endura. They returned home for the first time to Suva on the weekend to a sold-out stadium. And take a listen to this, because this is what happened after the game. We've all been there. The result didn't matter on the day, does it? And it doesn't matter to the Fijians. This is the sound of Fiji. Hold on, no, no, no. Oh, the, the result didn't matter on the day for me. It certainly you. mattered <laughs> for me and the Highlanders. <laughs> and it was the hundredth game for Tony Brown yeah. coaching. And it meant to them. And I think at half time, I think it dawned on the fact that you know, we're in a true battle. So I look at this and go, I think I was smiling for a number of reasons. Yeah. But first and foremost, when the television cameras came on and I saw the crowd, we all wanted to be there. Mills, <laughs> Jake, you, Kirsty, no, you're somewhere, you probably somewhere else. <laughs> hey, I'll come. I'll come for the trip. You'll come for the trip. I tell you what, 15, Jake. 15,000. This is why I look forward to next season when all of their games are at home, hopefully, and we get to see this on a weekly basis. I wanted your Highlanders to lose. <laughs> I wanted them to lose just because of the event. I know you're passionate about it, but I just think that, like, <laughs> like, like you said, it is Fiji. They were singing, it's great, but they needed to win, and that would have been great for the environment. And I'm just disappointed that you guys came back. To be and fair, ruined I would have the party. I to beat you last week. So <laughs> what am I saying? I mean, but you know what, what I mean. Like, what, what a thinking? fantastic event. We spoke about it, Mills. We talked about Moana Pacifica. Yeah. You know, trying to get back to Samoa and Tonga to play. Mm. This was amazing, and this is what we talked about: international rugby giving back to the community. Not only do you see the crowd, but you've got a, your Highlanders in a hotel, bringing money into the into the environment. You've got broadcasters there spending money and that's what I think is important for for the whole day you just wrecked it by the Highlanders winning no, was, yeah I mean what you've said is absolutely on, on the money I, I I'm glad the Highlanders did win because this is a tough game for them to go over there and play a team in their own backyard where they play that expensive rugby this is where they score most of their tries from when they're sort of how to scout it almost just outside their own yep. 22 they struggle when they get into the 22 but it's one of the to make I'm, I'm with you I'm looking forward to how they play, you know, next year and when teams have to go there because it is it is very difficult. You know, although they're nice and friendly after the game and they mm. sing and that and the, and the emotions all there, man, it's pretty hostile yeah. too when they start cheering. Well, the yeah. style of rugby is entertaining, isn't it? It's what we want to watch. Does it remind you of what Super Rugby was at the House of Pain? Uh, look, I, I, I would say this: it was clearly it was clearly warm, it was clearly challenging, but yes, it's a reminder of what the game used to be. And of course, it's 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 new. It's new to Fiji and Super, and they've tasted games, but it hasn't been their team. It hasn't been their side. So I think this was this was a huge step forward of of why we needed them in the competition, why we need them in the competition in the long term, and the fact that it was clear they were competitive. Was I concerned at halftime? Absolutely I was concerned. It was the fact that we desperately needed that result. So to get that was great, but the standard has been set for everybody else the fact that I'd love to see that joy once again. And by the way, I don't think there was a card in that game, which means it was played in the right spirit, with the right accuracy with teams who wanted to go out and play some rugby. The only thing I don't want to happen to the draw or Moana Pacifica I don't want them to play like us. No. I mean, the thing I'm loving about the draw especially is they are playing with flair, they're playing with Fijian style, they're throwing caution to the wind at times, especially inside their own 22. And I just hope that doesn't get uh, knocked out of them. I mean, you can see from this try here. I got a sense, Mills, like every time there was a mistake, I thought they'd go 90. I thought they'd go the length of the field. That's what it felt like yeah. to watch them play, right? You know, and even after they scored their very first try, all of a sudden they tried to do a double miss, virtually in their own end goal, you know, and they chucked it into the sideline. You know, so there's a freedom about the way they play. But that's playing to their strengths, right? Yeah, they've they, they found a real nice balance in terms of what Mick Burns sort of found in terms of their style. They they want to create stuff from inside their own inside their own half. When they get, they actually struggle when they get into the 22s because they don't know they, they actually go to a totally different style. So I'm glad they sort of found that balance. I'm glad that sort of it's created running raid, but also. It almost seems like, not, do we need to fix anything then? If the, if the competition's close now, the Australians are playing well, the Drua, they're, they're competitive, and Moana, is there anything that needs to be fixed? Well, the I'm only sure. thing that needs to change, I reckon, is breakdown on the road in Suva next year.
would be... Well, there's another home I'd game, suggest. May 27, against the Chiefs. We can still go over oh, if you want. Oh, you still late. make it. It's not oh, too late. We'll make it. I, just, I, I do want to say a big congratulations to Brownie. You know, um, loyalty as a, an individual and as a coach and his commitment to the Highlanders and, you know, his 100th... His 100th test match, um, 100th game coaching wow, the Highlanders. I mean, that's, came that's, a lot. Oh, that's also with He's been around a while, to be Jamie, fair. Yeah. He's been around a while. That cheese cutter's been around a long time. Yeah. Um, but uh, and a tough year. I, mean, I, I know there was an alumni uh, group that got together down in Dunedin, but the, the messages that were going across WhatsApp were, were awesome. You know, everyone was there with him, wanting him to, to uh, chase success after what's been yeah. a difficult year. It's really nice. Really, really well said, Jeff. Uh, well, we've got James Parsons coming on after the break. But before we go, we've got the trivia question for you to get involved in and for these guys as well, because we love putting them on the spot. Are you ready for it? I know, Jeff. I was ready last, last week. week. I was ready last it, week. And, uh, I took until the part three for me to get uh, acknowledged, to be fair. I won it. Well done. No, you didn't win it, JK. I thought okay. I won it last week. Well, you know what this week is? It's a little bit different. What happened next? Ooh. Have a look at this. Pictures. Time the Hurricanes get a little bit of weight on as Reed hands it back to Ellis. And uh, Nono gets in there and thumps his man to the ground. And uh, through the gap goes Marshall. He almost waited his way through. He wasn't held. And he got up and went again to uh, Tom Marshall. Good run from him, the fullback. As uh, the Crusaders, well, if they got enough players into the ruck, no, they've knocked it on. They didn't have enough representation at the ruck, and the Hurricanes shoved them. So we've got a, we've got a flag, I, I believe. This time the Hurricanes get a little bit of weight on as Reed hands it back to Ellis. And uh, Nono gets in there and thumps his man to the ground. And uh, through the gap goes Marshall. He almost waited his way through. He wasn't held. And he got up and went again to uh, Tom Marshall. Good run from him, the fullback. As uh, the Crusaders, well, if they got enough players into the ruck, no, they've knocked it on. They didn't have enough representation at the ruck, and the Hurricanes shoved them. So we've got a, we've got a flag, I, I believe. Welcome back into the breakdown. It's great to have you with us. And we've got a new uh, member of the team as well, James Parsons. Great to have you joining us. Uh, that is your trivia question for today. What happens next? So we'll throw you straight into the hot seat, Jeff, <laughs> but tell us in detail, because I know you love a detail, what happens? Uh, well, firstly, thanks for having me. But Goldie was mentioning line speed before, and I think Ma showed it quite uh, severely there. And he, and he hit his mate, Dan Carter, probably with uh, no wrap and, uh, and a shoulder to the lid. Are you all in a grant, or has uh, anyone else got something? Isn't there, th didn't Andrew Hall say something to the, the referee? He said something like, um, weren't we allowed to touch Carter and uh, Carter and McCaw? Is that right? Oh, is it that one? Is it that game? Well, let's take a look, shall oh, we? Definitely, let's have I a look. What happened next? I mean, it, it was a card. Did they have cards back then? <laughs> against? Against. It doesn't matter. 12, 12 gold. No, it's not late, if you ask me. 12? No way it's late. He just hasn't used his arms. Oh, are you serious? Yeah. Hey, look, we just got a late, late, late tackle oh. against 12 in case we're going back to the penalty. So that was... Mate, that's what it is. Are we not allowed to tackle the car? Oh, did you hear that? <laughs> yes, I did, yes. That's genius, Andrew Hoare. You're not allowed to tackle Dan Carter in this game. Oh. <laughs> oh. oh, God. <laughs> I'll oh, take that. that was nice, work. nice work, Mills. Great You've been a holiday, though, right? Too easy, guys. Too easy. You too. Brilliant work, as always. Hope you got that one at home as well. And remember, you can get involved. You can send in the questions for these guys on our Instagram page, Sky Sport Rugby uh, is the page you need to look up to send in some questions. Let's get straight into it, though, because I know JK is very excited to talk about front rowers. <laughs> so you know excited, what got you in here. So excited about this, Jipper. Obviously, big news. Front row right, discussion. <laughs> Don't waste any time. First question. Well, my question is, I picked Angus Ta'avol. <laughs> but you only picked one prop in your squad yeah, last well, week. Yeah, well, they can cover all sides. Oh, right. So, so that, was my, that was my question. Do I need to? <laughs> my question is this. You know, the dark arts, Darth Vader, you know, guys <laughs> that can cover both sides. I mean, do they, how competent do they need to be? And is it still a thing when you can have two on the bench? Um... Probably not, because there is two on the bench, and I think we need to move more towards probably that specialist mindset. Um, but Off is probably the one player that can do it at both sides at, at international level. Outside of that, it would, it would be a push, I'd say. So there is the opportunity for them to pick five props in the squad and maybe free up a spot on the loose forwards, which might be a challenging 
position to pick. Oh, I knew you would have written down your All Black team already. He's already done it. You heard Ian Foster last week talk about 36. The moment the show finished, you would have started going, right, how do I, how do I work this one out? You would have split it maybe 20, was it 20 and 16, it's something like that, five props. But, forwards, but bottom line, uh, look, I'll ask you, um, Joe Moody's out injured now yeah. um, for the season. Tragic news, uh, you know, and I know that's, it's challenging for Joe, and I know you've got all the support of the rugby community behind, it, behind you. But, Jippa, all of a sudden it's... Who is the next cab off the rank that's going to be our anchor at loose head prop? Because we've always had someone. Tony Woodcock did that job for so, so long. Joe Moody took up the next mantle. Who is it? Who's the next guy? Well, I suppose at the moment, in terms of experience and, and age, it's probably George Bauer. He's the incumbent that was sitting behind Joe at the end of the year. Big body as well. You know, talked about physicality at the end of year tour. You know, he'd be able to hold his own at scrum, but also in those collision areas. Outside of that, I think it's opportunity um, of, of playing yourself in the squad. But with a new selector, obviously, with Joe Smith there, it does, uh, I suppose, potentially bring around change because, they, you know, it's only one man's opinion and he may look at the game differently or see other, other skills that are more necessary. So if they're going to do that change this close to a World Cup, I think it has to be now. And, and guys like Aidan Ross, who have backed up, you know, two big seasons, I think Alex Hodgman's coming back into his own. He, he really suited um, that, that All Blacks environment when he was there. Um, so there's a number of guys in the end of group who got a bit of work at the end of the year as well. Has Aidan Ross been a big mover this season? Look, I thought he was a big mover last season and he obviously got caught into the squad. But with the All Blacks, you normally have to back it up two years in a row. And I think he's done that. He's had some challenge with Ollie Norris. I think Ollie Norris has got a massive future. Um, but, but Aidan is a no mess around sort of bloke and, and, and sort of player like a Woody that would, would fit and, and suit international footy. Chip, I, I want to ask, because you know about this, the specialist guys, and you know, often in the past, we've, we've used specialists to really be able to get that dominance, that physical dominance at, at scrum time. But I want to look at sort of the, the bench, because we'll be, we have the luxury of guys being really expansive when they've come off the bench. Do you think now we have to turn to that sort of specialist guy off the bench rather than an expansive sort of a player like a Tony Alatupo, for instance, that, 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 that tipped the, the Reds? Yeah, look, I think um, Angus is probably a key guy there. Like, he has the ability, and I think his scr he's been scrumming the house down. The Chiefs are the least reset scrum, um, which is a big factor, you know, and, and he's got a big engine, so he can do things other players can't. You know, he can do a big scrum and then play a role with the ball, and I think a Taniela Tupo is the same as that. So um, that impact off the bench after that collision's probably been won. You've got to win that collision first. You probably need to send guys like Offer and George out, and then a guy like Gus against tiring bodies can be almost like an extra loose forward. You heard it here first, people. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first. Have you got another question? <laughs> I've got another question. Oh, good. I've, I've noticed in Super Rugby that the hookers are actually getting, well, some hookers are getting smaller, right? Like there's the Brumbies hooker is probably more your size than Samasoni's size. So do you think that's a future trend or international level a bit tougher? I think it uh, depends on the style of play and where that hooker plays. But if it's, uh, you know, it, where... We sort of saw um, the Northern Hemisphere tour for both the All Blacks and Australia. Um, the bigger body is probably needed. Like that's why Samasoni came into his own because he could get across that game line, which would mean it was hard for the defence to get set. They didn't get set early, and it gave us opportunities on attack. So um, I think it's horses for courses, but it'll be based on that style. Um, and I think Samasoni's, well, that try he scored on the weekend. Um, you know, he's playing the house down. He's nailing his set piece, so he's definitely putting himself in the frame. I want to throw another name out for you. Jermaine Ainsley, for those that may not know him, he is eligible for the All Blacks. He's been playing in Australia. I think, Jeff, you played with his father. Yeah, I did uh, with, with Joey. I did, absolutely. Um, he's a better scrummager than Joey. There's no doubt about that. But I tell you what, Joey was a great bus, bus driver. Um, and he was a great team man. And he is this man, this young man, has been a great, great addition yeah. to this squad, I think. And he's a guy, he's played three tests for the Wallabies, or three games for the Wallabies, I think, Jipper. But now, all of a sudden, he's going to be eligible for the All Blacks. Um, is he a player? Why? Is that is that the same rule apply for everyone? It's yeah, not second rule. tier nations. No, nah, it's what it, it's whatever nation you choose if oh, you're wow. eligible for it. I just thought that was for second tier. There no, you go. no, no. Thirty six no. months stand down. But um, I mean, you look I at his game. I, I think he's he's been a rock for them. Um, their scrum has been a great platform. The Hollanders. Um, if you use the Hurricanes game, they milked a number of penalties to keep them in that when they were struggling, and he's a big part of that. So is Liam Coltman. Are you saying they milk penalties? Oh, in scrums you Oh, do. right. Oh, I thought it was a fair contest every time you went down, Jipper. No, not down. They kept him in the back of the scrum. Oh, right, you know, OK. And, and kept pushing and kept pushing. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, legitimately. Yeah, yeah. I've got Can you. I just yeah. have a clarification of your squad that you spoke about before, besides Angus Tavol being in there like my squad? <laughs> Did you say that you're going to take more props than loose forwards, or you take no, go you... covers both sides yeah, so you can add and, an extra forward. loose forward or a midfield, whichever is the challenging. That's the potential so to do that with a guy like Offer. 
Oh, I'd still go with six, but I'm just saying for the selection. <laughs> of course you they would. May, they may. Uh, may so you go four that. specialists and one. Potentially. Sides. Potentially. So where, where does Lomax sit then? Is, is he the, the guy that now starts? I think Offer starts at tight head. Uh, I think Offer's playing the house down. I think it's the best yep. footy he's played in a long time. Um, you, you saw, you know, he got his face rucked off against the Chiefs. He was back up against the Crusaders the next week. Um, and you talk about physical collisions and winning them. Man, you, there's not many people who win them against Big Offer. I've got to ask you, Chip, but the bottom line, uh, we had a really challenging end of year tour last year and so much talk about what the Northern Hemisphere forward packs are doing and particularly the skill set of the front rows. Have you seen a shift? Do you think there'll be a change? Or is it allowing our players to show their skill set? We've got to trust our DNA and the way we play and, and it's got to work for us. But obviously there's going to be a big focus on the, the bigger body to win the collisions that we, we probably didn't win on the end of the tour. And if you look at Porter... And, and Furlong, who are coming down to, to take us on, man, they do the core roles, but they're some of the most skillful yeah. props going around. Like, some of the lines Furlong runs, his ability to stay square at the line and give that ball out the back, he doesn't even look to Sexton, and it creates those opportunities for Porter and co outside to run holes. So they've got that in their DNA, and they're going to play fast, and they, they'll, they'll challenge us at our own game. So we've got to stick to that and back ourselves to be, be faster and win those collisions so we can get them on the back foot. Do we know what our DNA is anymore? Oh, I believe so. I think if you look at the way we play our game, it is it is to be fast tempered. But I agree. Like in the Super Rugby, we're starting to see maybe it is the Dave Rennie factor. But I think it's more the players that have been involved with Dave Rennie bringing it back to their Super squads and, and keeping it simple. Like they're literally looking early to just you know win those collisions and get across the gain line, or defensively just get bodies to ground, have the ability to set and attack the right breakdown. So I, I, we're we're getting challenged in our own attack. Systems and not, the defence isn't allowing us the freedom that we're used to. Uh, we'll adjust and uh, we'll be better for it this weekend. So great to see you with a smile on your face. We're going to talk about hookers before we move on. Who is your number one hooker at the moment since they're scoring all the tries in Super Rugby, Jet? <laughs> well, if, you, if you're going on tries, Kurt Eklund would have to be up there. Uh, look, I, I, th I think um, Sam Asoni's going really well. Cody's obviously um, always there or thereabouts, so those two are probably battling it out. Um, Asafa Amul hasn't been able to be on the on the grass as much as like. Colsey's obviously the same. Mm. I think young guys like Eklund and O'Reilly have been awesome. I think they've they've made that step up. I think O'Reilly, someone that you know hasn't had that many opportunities, he's, he's plied his trade for a long time and, and he's now getting them, is showing that he has that ability. And, and obviously Curdy I'm a big fan of because he's at the Blues and, and he's doing the same. Not just the tries either. Would it's, you, it's his work in defence. Would you take Dane Coles? I personally would because I think even if, if he's fit, Obviously, you don't take him if he can't play footy, but if he's fit, um, he, he can bring something during the week, whether he plays or not, that others can't. And we know the value of that. We saw it with Kevy in 2015. Uh, in, in my opinion, it's no different to, to Colsey in this situation. You'll be like a kid in a candy store. You've got an entire segment to talk about front <laughs> rows. And you know what? We're going to continue this with another one of your favourite subjects, the Blues, because let's take a look at the Super Rugby Pacific uh, table. After 11 rounds, the Blues are sitting pretty, JK. 40 points. They are out in front. You cannot take anything away from them. They've won nine in a row. Yeah, they'll be disappointed with their 80-minute performance. I think they've been very, very good until the last couple of weeks. So, And we mentioned it on the show earlier, Crusaders are the same. I mean, so they'll be looking to get back and just put a 80-minute performance. The difference is they, they've squeaked a couple of wins out, pushed late, Jipper, but, mm. you know, you've just come out of that environment. That would be their, that would be their main focus now? Well, so often I heard um, when I was part of the team, you know, these guys can't even win ugly. We're now winning ugly um, and getting points on the board when we're probably not playing as well as we'd like. Um, the, the main thing probably is the turnover rate. You know, 38% of the ball is because we're turning over, um, you know, 13 times, I think it was, and, and, and normally in our half. And we know when the Blues are going well, they get their kick structure well, they get a good chase, and then, that, you know, once they're in that 22, they get points. So we're not showing the other side of the table. Do you want to see where the Highlanders are sitting? No, it's fine, it's fine. I can fine. tell you, you where know, they're like, sitting, I, 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 a, a massive shift, you know, just, just so it's clear. This season's not over. They're not the only six teams in this competition. Let's be honest. The is is the top making... eight too many? Uh, in some ways, you think it um, when you can you can make the playoffs when you're going to have a losing record. Yeah. I mean, that's the reality. Here it is, Jeff. Just on. to keep you happy. Yeah, thanks very much. There you're it is. The Highlanders made a massive move. No, they haven't in the same spot they were last week. <laughs> but that's all right. That's Two fine. They're heading the in the right direction. Uh, but I think that was a big result today for the Hurricanes. You know, but we should focus on the Blues because yeah. the Blues are the team right now who probably a couple of weeks ago we looked as though they were completely dominant in the way they were playing Mills. Oh, the yeah. fact that look as though they were wel welcoming guys back. Akira Yawani was really really. 
really good. Roger Tuovasa Sheik, but it, it hasn't been convincing. Yeah. Why hasn't it been convincing? You've got to also look. He's still rota rotating inside. He's got a couple of young guys. He had two weeks in a row where that was probably his A, a team. Then he's sort of rocked up now. Uh, in Perth, uh, nice to see Akira Ioane back as well. Mm. There's a Signa stall in, in the mix. So, what he's actually doing is, is, is complementing his whole squad and keeping them in, involved. You, you're saying it, and it's it's not it's not pretty, but they're still winning and they're still at the top the top of the table. It's just that sort of that last of a wee bit. And once they get to the business end, I reckon they'll start firing just as just what they did a couple of weeks ago with with the A team. Once he's settled on that. And I, and I think Leon even came out with after the game. He feels he's going to have the ability to pick whoever he wants moving forward. He's just over, you know, compliance of the, the, the All Black rules and then, you know, now he can probably get a solid 23 because they do need to build that momentum going into the playoffs. We've seen it time and time again with the Crusaders. It's funny that, that they have rule. the ability. Yeah. That All Black rules a factor, isn't it, in selection now? Are everyone's it? rested though now in the Blues from an All Black? Oh, I'm just going off what Leon said mm. and he said it's nearly done, so I'm assuming that. Another question. Possibly Patrick Tupolotu is out of the Japanese competition next week. Can he come back into the side? I don't have an answer for that, but I'd like to think so. <laughs> but I'd I'd, like I, I think, think so if you too. look at um, who was it last year? Someone, Barrett, yeah, Barrett. Or was it Barrett? Yeah. I think you had. Sure. To, I think you had to have. An, I think there has to be an injury, though. I think it has to be a replacement. Yeah. I can't oh, think that's it just, easy. It just. It, yeah, I don't oh, think they can roll straight back in. I yeah, think. Yeah, like picking. I think. A, if and it's and a look, ender. if he's available and they have someone, and I mean that's professional sport, right? I thought you had to be contracted. To New yeah, but you can that's sign a contract anytime. I mean, if, I mean, just like an interim, yeah. like the player they bring in would have to sign an interim. I've had, it was TJ's one that's a little bit different because yeah. he was off contract. No, that was the, he's on, that was he's on contract because he's on sabbatical. So he's, he's on a sabbatical, sabbatical so and the you, Blues have already talked. That's to him. right. So it's definitely in the frame. But talking about Leon McDonald, obviously we know that the Blues fans have been through so much pain over the last decade. Jeff, what has changed? What has changed between last year when they won uh, the Super Rugby Trans Tasman competition and this year? You'd have to say title favourites right now. Yeah, look, I think a big part of it is, is you know, the board have been fantastic in providing the opportunities uh, for us to build a great squad and, and have the facilities that, that are second to none. Um, Andrew Hoare, you know, works tirelessly. They've now got um, Josh Blackie in there as GM of rugby and then, you know, that coaching group has, has brought a, a real edge and, and, you know, Tom's been successful everywhere he's gone for a reason and, and he knows how to make packs tough. And, and knows how to make packs um, have the ability, even when they're going backwards, potentially to still win these games. So um, that coach is a massive part. And then I think a lot of the younger group that have played a lot of rugby together for a long time are now the senior guys. Yeah. So it, it's, it's a mass amount of numbers that are, that are good leaders within the squad around standards and, and, and that work ethic. Look, he's a good mate of ours, JK, and I'm remiss to say that, but John Hart, wherever he's gone and had an influence off the field, particularly around the board table, he's brought an investment into the game in the Blues area in development of people and of players, but also they've targeted how to make the Blues better. All of a sudden, if you write down their two squads, if they had to write down two 15s, that's to me their biggest strength, which was was the Crusaders' biggest strength. You could write down two different 15s. You always had backup. The Blues have done it really, really well, but they've developed local talent. I've got as a well trivia to get for that you. Point. Oh, there you go. Is this Here's a, a trivia. Is this People, a new trivia. JK's trivia. <laughs> Who was running the Warriors the last time they made the top eight? The Warriors. John Hart. John Hart. Thank you. I won. <laughs> it was a question. Yeah, that's how you win your own game in television. It's planned by himself. No, answer your own question. <laughs> I was going to say John Hart, but yeah, surely it was John it. But I think, uh, so I, that, that organisation, I think the interesting thing Seth. that Jipper spoke about, and this is something that you, know, you often don't think about at home, it starts at the board level. Yeah. It starts at the board, it's the CEO, it's the whole organisation working together. And I think if you want to be a championship site, every part of that has to be performing to its best. And JP, you went through it. Leadership was always a challenge with the Blues, but it looks as though across the board now, right? Oh, yeah, I think that, that power of leaders by numbers, you know, you, when you've got more voices leading or, you know, more people showing the way, um, action leadership, service leadership, there's been a big focus on our community. It brings the best out of people. Well, Jipper, uh, I'm sure you've enjoyed yourself today. I'm sure Certainly you'll be leaving has. with a smile <laughs> on your face. Thank you so much for coming in. We appreciate your time and we'll see you very soon, Thanks I'm sure. Thanks for having me. Jeez. Well, if you haven't had enough rugby to watch, there's even more because the Black Fern Sevens are back on the World Series for the first time in a very, very long time. It's a beautiful thing. Let's take a look at the day one highlights in Langford. They've been caged up for over 800 days. They are going to be a huge presence. 
And now, great ball. Had Anita Blyde and Blyde a little cheeky smile as it opened up. She got a wonderful ball from her skipper. And we'll get the final score of the match. Again, a couple of these passes floating a little bit. Tough conditions here, and this time they've actually intercepted the ball. That's how quickly they're up in the middle. And through the middle, high kneeing it, Sheree Kaka. Desperation stuff from both sides as New Zealand try to find a way to attack. Well, Woodman goes herself. Woodman, the chase is coming from Fiji. And Portia Woodman, and what would have been a famous, famous win, just slips from the grass for Fiji. Kia ora guys, welcome to the Kavaru Hale. It's my turn for the Jersey Tales. Come in and follow me. Yeah, so this is my uh, my 100 games for the Chiefs. It's actually a one-off jersey that, that got made from my, my good friend David Burke. Um, I come from Rotorua, grew up a, a bay boy. I'm obviously a Waikato man through and through now, but uh, I always wanted to be a Chief when I was, I was younger. Came from the Sevens and took a lot of convincing to convince people that I was more than just the Sevens player and um, this is a team um, that made me, you know, get to express myself in, in the 15s game. It's a team that's uh, real close to my heart, runs through my veins, it's in my DNA. You know, once Dave Rennie sort of came in 2012, he really um, got a deeper, deeper connection to, to the, the area of where we came from and also um, of our logo and of, of our people. So, um, yeah, it's, it's an awesome team to be a part of. It's something I'm always going to cherish for the rest of my life is that I got to, to be, become a chief. Yeah, this is a very special jersey, um, the New Zealand Māori jersey. Uh, it's our 100 year anniversary. Uh, we played the New Zealand Barbarians, the Irish and the English um, for that year. Um, a lot of history, a lot of mana um, in this jersey and what's gone before us. It's a great honour to be able to lead the, the New Zealand Māori um, in, in battle and, and especially for a year like this, just look with the history behind the jersey and, and what it means to, to our people um, and, to, and to the boys. How different do you feel playing for that team as opposed to the All Blacks? When you actually come into New Zealand Māori, um, rugby's the last thing on the list. It's about connection, about who you are, um, about who we are as people. Um, and a lot of boys don't grow up in, in the, that Māori them or uh, grow up in Māori family. So teaching the boys waiata, where they come from, the haka, um, even to the good old Māori food, you know, the hangis, the boil-ups. It doesn't happen now because they've turned it to a high performance team, but when I first started, um, it was awesome team to be a part of because you're just coming off a, a real intense Super Rugby campaign. You just come into the Māori team and you just dumped it. Like there's no pressure to play. You just, training's literally is like, you get to training, you play touch for an hour. Um, the coach at the time, it may be, said to one of the leaders, the older boys, sort out the line outs, sort out what you guys want to do for the game. And then, um, that's pretty much what you see on the field too, the boys just going out there and people call it the Māori flair and it's just the boys um, throwing the ball around and having fun and doing what they're born to do. Pinched by Aaron Smith and off goes Stephen Brett for the Māori, looking to link up, he gets it away to Liam Bissom. Can he get there? Skidding over! Oh, there's a sevens one here, we've got a uh, Rugby World Cup. That's pretty skinny, that's pretty small. It must have been about 90 kgs back then. Don't even think I could fit that now. I won two Commonwealth Games gold medals with the New Zealand Sevens, um, Melbourne and Delhi. But the jersey I do want to show you is, it is a Sevens one. I actually didn't get to play in it. Um, it was Gordon Titchen's dream team. Um, just the jersey here. Um, and the reason why this is so special to me because there's absolutely legends of the game on this jersey. And to see my name just doesn't seem feel right. I don't, you know, I don't feel like I deserve to have my name uh, among these legends of the of the game. Guys like Eric Rush, Dallas Seymour, the big fella Jonah, Cully, um, a Massey Valance, and uh, I don't know how Lady KT got on here either, but he's on here. Um, but yeah, this is this is one of the jerseys that um, that's special to me just because of the the players that are on on this this jersey. Yeah, this is my debut jersey. Um, 2008 Edinburgh in Scotland. Uh, yeah, just all that hard work that's um, gone through the years to finally get the, the black jersey and the silver fern. Uh, it was a pretty proud moment, not just for myself, but my family. Um, 
good chunk of my family came up to uh, Scotland for the game too, so it was a pretty, pretty special moment for, for me and my family to be able to put on the, the fam famous black jersey. Quick hands, Savia, here's Hoare. David back inside, Nessam again! Liam Nessam! I've been in and out of the All Blacks uh, all my career. Um, I, think, I think I might have played eight games from 2008 to 2012 and then um, worked my butt off to, to get back into the, the jersey and stay there for a little bit longer and hopefully uh, left an impact or a positive influence on, on that black jersey. And um, yeah, it's just, for me, it's just the, you know, the perseverance and the resilience and you know, just to take the, the good with the bad and just keep moving forward. And um, for me, it wasn't trying to, trying to stay there or try and prove people wrong. It was just that I knew in myself that I, I deserved to be there and, and wanted to work hard every day to, to put on that black jersey all the time. That's my Jersey Tales. Thanks for letting me share it. Very, very cool. Uh, he was around for a long time. I'm pretty sure he hasn't retired officially yet, has he, Mills? Yeah, probably has he? Probably still going, isn't he? He's playing NPC or something like that. <laughs> I think he is. So good. I mean, I mean you, you often, so great seeing these sort of stories because yeah. you sort of forget sort of the journey these guys have gone through. I mean, you look at Mess and how he started, yeah. you know, predominantly a sevens player. It's such a hard transition to come from the sevens. Well, you see how skinny he was, but the physical side, because of his, you know, the position that he actually played to then push on, you know, in, in the, in the Mouldies and obviously the All Blacks, but this also his presence within that Chiefs, that Chiefs side, the real mana that he, that he had in there. So what he's given back in those jerseys, you know, I mean, so special. Great to see. Yeah, and adversity. I, I think um, it's way harder for a player like Liam to be great, because it would have been easier to give up, go overseas, do other things. You know, got left out of the All Blacks. Often he was on the fringe. And I know legend is used a lot mm. um, when you talk about All Blacks, but for me, he is one because he absolutely yeah. maximised his potential. He, he became a great leader. Um, you wanted him in the team even if someone was playing ahead of him. And I think that means you are special. Um, every time you meet him, he does, you know, another word that people use a lot is mana, but he has incredible mana. And also putting maori forward often, being a real positive role model, just awesome. He's got deep pockets too, mate. <laughs> real deep. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, he's watching, I know he is. I know he's watching. Hey, hey mate. <laughs> you know, we have got deep pockets, and that is over in the UK and Europe. Mills, you've been watching some rugby uh, from there yesterday. You were very impressed, which I, means I, should we be worried? I think we should be. I, when I was watching um, the game yesterday morning, I just flicked it on. I was like, I was intrigued about how the, the skill set, and, and it's interesting to hear what Jip sort of mentioned, you know, that our DNA and how we sort of play. But also the confidence um, that they're, they're playing our similar style to what we have. You know, they almost picked up that DNA and thought, okay, well let's let's test it and um, and, and go with it. And now they've got the skill set to be. I mean, look at this. I know he was with the Blues. Are you happy with that? Um, JK, <laughs> the skill set there. But um, with Joe, but um, oh, so impressed. Crowds, great crowds as well, and the spectacle is amazing. Uh, Australia. Same, same. I, I don't. I think the English competition mills is better than the French competition. I watch the French competition a wee bit more, but. It's funny, yesterday I, was, I did the same. I looked at the highlights from the top 14. Um, but I do think we are in... It's going to be an amazing World Cup. Australia play England in the middle of the year and we play Ireland. Uh, those two series are going to be so much fun. Uh, to find out exactly where teams are at, let's hope that both squads come down being strong. You'd imagine they would like to if you're going to come to the Southern Hemisphere and perform. But I think across the board, you know, all of a sudden we've seen what France are uh, prepared to deliver. We know exactly where Scotland have got to in the short term. Remembering as well, Dave Rennie had an influence in their game over there as well. So yeah, are, we, are we concerned? In interesting, I think, I have, um, Mills, is when I started writing down my All Black squad, it was, I was looking for what's different, what's going to change, who are the personnel that are going to come through. And we've had so many guys who have been in the All Black environment. When I look at what they're doing in the Northern Hemisphere and what we know what's coming, it's who's going to be the game changers for us, or is it going to be up to the players who have been there before? A bit of both. I think once you, there's obviously competition across the board in terms of, in particular, our playmakers, right? You know, our nine, nine and ten, our drivers, there's even a bit of competition at the back, which have sort of rotated over the last few years. So I think for, for me, really, is once he's settled on guys, he's got to stick with them because we can't sort of start chopping and changing. This is, this is going to be a massive series. I'm looking forward to this. He's, he's about to start singing again. Oh, he's about, I can hear his 18 tests well, to go I'm just trying already. to read his notes. Is 18 that, tests um, to go. 18. That, that's, that's Roger... To of us a shek. Mm. We need to fast track him because he has X Factor. I'm not, I don't know if he can make the next level. Everything I've seen, 
I believe that he is a game changer. We need, with the way we currently play, we need game changers at the next level. We need X Factor, we've had them right across the board. And I think the opposition, Ireland, England, France, um, are absolutely improved. And we're gonna have to have some X Factor, and that's him. That's, you know, does he deserve to make the side from old school principles? He probably have not play, played enough footy, but I'd put him straight in. Mills, if Bowden Barrett or Richie Moanga gets injured, are we in trouble? Well, he, who would be the next cab off the rank? I mean, you'd say Bryn Gatlin, is he? Is he would he be the... I mean, we, we would be. I mean, Damien McKenzie. Oh, Damien McKenzie's on his way back. back. Whether he wants to or not. Um, you know, McKenzie I'm, has got to be signed. You get on the plane, you, you know, if you're Ian Foster, get on the plane and go and sign him. He is fundamental for us winning the next World Cup because he's our third. Um, and he also brings X Factor in something different. Uh, he'll hate me saying this, and it's no disrespect to him, but I still think he is the best off the bench player late in the test match ever. We totally missed him against England in that semi-final game in Japan. We need him back. What about Peter Garcia Kula? We've talked about him a lot this year, haven't we? It comes down pure and simply about where we see Artie Savia and what we are looking for at number eight and whether or not we want fresh blood mills, whether we want someone in an all-black jersey and give them an opportunity to have one last crack. And maybe it's against Ireland because you've got Akira Iwani, you've got Hoskins Satutu. Can Peter Gus do that? Look, there's no doubt he's walking behind a team. I, I think, for me, I'd like to see him get an opportunity. I'd like to see him get an opportunity as well. I think he's played exceptionally well. He's, he probably deserves it as well. His form's outstanding. So, yes, yes, for me. Are you prepared to lose some test matches to do that? That's all I'll ask. Maybe answer it next week. <laughs> well, we don't have time to answer it this week. It's been a fantastic show. We've got plenty of questions, right? Well, the podcast, the Breakdown podcast, go and download it. And guess what? Rugby is coming back to New Zealand. There'll be four games coming up this weekend, so get out, support them, and next week, Breakdown will be coming to you from Wellington. We'll see you next week. But it is the Chiefs who get us moving. Solkula comes away and they get the collect. To the gets a lovely ball away and what about the finish? Floats it over to Mata Ellen. First game this season, first try this season. in Suba. But the Crusaders are going to keep swinging and they're in at the Waratahs. They have arrived. Breakdown is brought to you by Neurofen Zavance. Available every day at Chemist Warehouse.